Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today in my voyages I've come to a place called Planet. This is a tech company in San Francisco which is making, well, it's making hundreds and hundreds of satellites that are doing some amazing things. And I got to talk to see these guys. Let's go and say hi. Okay, so we're now in the guts of Planet. We are with Rachel, who's going to show us around the Dove satellite. And not any Dove satellite. This is a very special, very horrible Dove satellite. Can you explain what this went through? Yes. Um, so this satellite, uh, back in 2014, uh, launched aboard an, an Antares rocket. And about 10 seconds into flight, the rocket exploded. Um, sending 28 doves careening into space and um, not very far into not space. Not very far into space. Um, a lot of them landed on the beach, and so uh, about 10 of our doves were salvageable, um, including this one. So this dove actually ex survived a rocket explosion. Making it the most curable dove satellite that you have. It is the most curable. We couldn't reset it and relaunch, unfortunately. So. Well, it still looks marvelous. I mean, it's really well preserved, but so I can talk over what can you show us about this thing? Let's, yeah, let's talk um, about it. I'll give you the, the brief rundown. So uh, we have, we build uh, three new CubeSats. So that's um, three small uh, university sized CubeSats, 10 by 10 by 10. 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. Centimeters stacked on top of each other. So we get this uh, long bus here. And um, the first kind of two thirds of the dove is a telescope. Um, so just the optics of the telescope. Yeah, just the optics of the telescope. Now, the back third here is the brains we have. Uh, reaction wheels, magnet workers, which help us point our satellites when they're on orbit, and then uh, we have the computers and the brains of the satellite back here too. And then um, this last bit here, we have a star camera, which also helps with pointing, and then we have our camera sensor. So, well, these are the solar panels, and they just fold up nicely. Can I do this? Oh yes. Oh wow! So this is how they're supposed to be stored, I guess. Yes. Wow. And so they're heavy. They're very heavy, and once they get deployed into space, um, they either deploy from the International Space Station or just off the side of a rocket if they're in higher orbit. Yeah. Um, once they get deployed, um, we pop them out. So you launch these. There are about you said about sixty of them in space. Yeah, sixty to seventy. Um, they're always we're always launching new ones, and they're always re-entering. So okay. we have between sixty and seventy in any. And uh, the idea is that these are obviously doing Earth observation that are in low orbit. With this camera, you only have a 4 inch, 100 millimeter aperture, I guess, in this form factor. Yes, very and, small. Uh, but at a uh, you know, couple of hundred miles up, what kind of resolution can you get? Um, well, these, depending on what orbit they're in, um, ISS or SSO, um, can image between 3 to 5 meters per pixel. So you can see anything that's 3 meters wide in one pixel. So you can see trees, forests, cities, cars, but you can't see people or... You can see a crowd of people. You can see a crowd of people. Yeah, <laughs> if there's a big concert, an outdoor concert, or oh. a Super Bowl, or things like that, you can see crowds of people, but they're less than a pixel. <laughs> but, I mean, so the, the resolution of these things is obviously not as good as that of a large dedicated imaging satellite. Exactly. But the advantage is, if you have 60 of these, you can get images faster. Yes, exactly. So with 60 of these, um, we have a, a phrase in the industry called revisit rate. So when we have tons of satellites up in orbit and they're constantly taking pictures as the Earth rotates below, um, we aim to get about 100 up. And once we get about 100, we'll have a picture of the Earth's entire landmass every day. So think of it as a Google map in three to five meter resolution of everywhere on Earth every day. Every day. Every day. So you can see kind of large scale changes, forests burning, um, uh, fields growing, things like that. But you can also kind of zoom down and look at a local local changes like the construction in a port or ships coming in and out of a port, things like that. So we, yeah, so we talked about Antares, that was a failure, and I guess I hear you were also on SpaceX CRS. Yes, we on the CRS 7 mission. Yeah, and that was a bit of a failure. Those were going to go, they weren't going to launch individually, those were going to go to the International Space Station and essentially get thrown out to the airlock using their, uh, their satellite launcher. Yeah, exactly. We used the International Space Station um, as a test bed um, to test new technology that we pack into these guys. So if we have a new sensor or a new radio that we want to test, we launched to space station orbit, 
and they get, yeah, like you said, they get it's a spring loaded launch. A launch spring loaded, it's, it's like a jack in the box that yeah. gets deployed out of the space station. It's and really and beautiful, I've seen it happen. Yeah. Oh, yes. It's really fun to watch. Um, over in the other room there, we set up a live cam and we all <laughs> gather down to watch our satellite phones. It's sure. very quick. It only takes about a second, but... <laughs> but yeah, you've launched on many other launchers that have been successful, let's be exactly. clear, because you've got a lot of spacecraft up there, yeah. so... Uh, we've launched um, on other orbital missions, other uh, SpaceX missions. We've launched with JAXA on an H2B. Um, we've launched on a Russian rocket um, in some of our earlier launches. We've launched on the PSLV in India. Wow. Um, so we have... You're really international. Probably yeah. the most international uh, space company yeah, in we, terms we, of the we launches. Yeah, we've set up... A, we are scheduled to launch on a, a new rocket, um, that Rocket Labs uh, down in New Zealand built. Oh, um, they're sure. building nano launchers, which are designed for small staffs like ours. So yeah. we're excited for that to come. Yeah, we, we don't discriminate. Uh, you don't discriminate. <laughs> we'll launch with uh, everybody in any. I just kind of want to get an idea of the lifespan of these. So they, they launch from the space station, but they all launch at roughly the same time from the roughly the same orbit. How do you get them spread out throughout the orbit? Ah, yes, so, that's a very good question. We use um, a technique called differential drag. So when you're that low in orbit um, where the space station is, um, we can deploy our satellites, uh, solar panels, and there are, there's still just enough atmosphere um, to space the satellites out as we make these minor adjustments while they're on orbit. So over a period of months, they slowly space out along the orbit um, as they point down and take pictures. So the sun will basically be sitting with their solar panels uh, parallel to the Earth, yeah. uh, atmosphere and the other one will be uh, perpendicular. Yeah, high drag, low drag. High drag, low drag, and they spread out. And if you adjust it enough, exactly, they spread out along the orbit. And the attitude control inside of these is by reaction wheels? Yeah, we use reaction wheels and magnet torque. And yeah, and then there's a star tracker here that's yeah. part of your orientation system. So exactly, um, we have a star camera, reaction wheels, magnet torquers, and GPS. And so these things, they, they basically go around the Earth, and they you task them every orbit or whatever. You task them to take photos at certain times, and then they squirt the data down so to a ground station. Exactly. So they automatically will take photos um, of the sunlight, um, especially in sun synchronous orbits. So. Okay. Um, we pre-plan and we automatically schedule all of their imaging windows and uh, once the images are on board, they get beamed down into a network. We have about 30 or so antennas and about six or seven big dishes spread around the spread world. Around the world. Um, and once the satellite passes over it, it beams down data um, or imagery yeah. um, and, and telemetry and things like that. And I'm guessing half of the challenge here is just simply coordinating such a large fleet in exactly. an automated you know, fashion. Yeah, I mean, if you look at um, other larger satellites, you see mission control and there are usually 10 or so people controlling, one monitoring one satellite. Well, we have 60 and we have about three people, um, we call them spaceship captains here. Oh. We have three spaceship captains that monitor our whole flock. And um, we've developed kind of a lot of uh, automation software in-house that allows these to operate uh, pretty much autonomously. And so our spaceship captains are essentially there to just debug when there's Make sure there's something not going wrong. And make sure if there's uh, something going wrong that it's uh, something. Yeah. Yeah. So it's great. We don't have 24 hour shifts or anything like that. Um, all of our spaceship captains get a weekend. Uh, oh, okay. They don't occasionally get a uh, text message from satellite saying, help, I've got a problem. Sometimes they do. But um, <laughs> it, it, we've designed a system that works relatively well on its own. All this data, you're producing essentially a map of the world. The aim is to produce a map of the world basically every day. Every day. And then there are people that will use this data for all sorts of things. I mean, you're talking, you suggested that uh, people in agriculture or you know, forest services, you can deal with uh, like firefighting, I guess. Exactly. You, can, fires. you can see lots of large scale change like forest fires or deforestation mining, things like that, so if people want to monitor natural resources, they can get a satellite picture of their mine or their field every day and see how it changes. So yeah, how much data does that take? Well, yeah, if you imagine 60 satellites imaging at all times and being down data into the ground stations, um, when we get that full picture of the Earth every day, it's going to be uh, about 5 terabytes a day wow, okay. that gets beamed down into our ground stations. <laughs> It's a, it's a stupid amount of data. It, it's a lot of data. 
It is a non-unreasonably large amount of data, yes. Yeah, this is a big data geographic style. And of course, you know, San Francisco seems to have a lot of big data companies. Exactly. I mean, we're starting to see the people who are interested in our imagery uh, are kind of these computer vision or machine learning experts who want to apply those techniques to satellite or imagery data. So yeah. there are people out calculating um, all of the solar panels that are put up in the world and things like that, writing algorithms so they can automatically detect um, all of the corn crops across the U.S. for better predictions. And, uh, there's a whole ecosystem of uh, kind of automated analysis tools that are bubbling up with this new data set. And yeah, you can get access to this data. There's limited data sets that are available for academics or... Both. Yeah, um, researchers can apply to get access to their area of interest online. And we also have a program that you can apply to called Open California. And you can see uh, all of California imagery um, that's uh, two weeks and before. So you get access to our full archive barring the last two weeks. I see. So you can get most up-to-date things. And let's be clear, you. You've got some really up-to-date images you were showing me earlier. Yes. You have floods in Louisiana and uh, fires. Yeah, and forest fires in California, floods right. in Louisiana, and fires in Portugal. Right, and we're probably, you know, you have, you'll have a earthquake. Yeah, the earthquake stuff. in Italy happened this morning, so we're we're monitoring that very closely and seeing what images we get now. Right. So this is it. You plan it. They're changing the world in a really fascinating way. This is awesome space tech. It's small. It's, it's so it, it's so technical. It's so technical, right? It's a San Francisco tech, uh, you know, Bay Area attitude, whatever. You can and carry it in a tote bag. You can carry. I it. don't. I don't recommend it. And I have to say, I'm going to point out these uh, captions on the site. You was it do do the impossible, right? Yeah. We have a, an artist in house who collects quotes and designs from all of us will gather in the meeting room and uh, pick our favorite quotes from literature or quotes that our mothers or fathers told us, or um, we, we even put little doodles on the side of the satellite. So <laughs> he gets these doodles from us and then he laser etches them onto the side, onto these side panels here, so. Yeah, and the PCBs have a nice design as well. Exactly, yeah. Every dev is a unique snowflake. They each have a different message or design on them. And then on the other side it says, who let the dogs out? Yeah, we have some jokers here at Planet. Uh, who let the dogs out? We have one that says Space Eggs. Space, oh, this one says Space Eggs, I think. Oh, it's Space Eggs. We have a, a guy on staff whose nickname is Eggs. So yeah, I was just kind of hanging around the planet lobby here with their fancy, of course, throw cushions and everything. But I found this amazing artifact from American space industry uh, history here, sorry. This is a Vernier engine. This is a Mercury Atlas Vernier engine from uh, 1960. Uh, it says it's from the DFJ Space Collection, which is uh, Steve Jurvetson, proper Silicon Valley space nerd. So uh, Vernier motors, of course, they're used for controlling the attitude of the rocket. These would generate maybe about a thousand pounds of thrust and they would fire kind of diagonally outward. You can see it on some of, the, uh, some of the photos and videos of the launches. And yeah, these would just keep the rocket straight, guide it, and they just, it's a magnificent artifact. Just look at this thing here. Oh, it's like being in the presence of greatness, I tell you.